Hello, Internet! Welcome to Film Theory, the show that wishes there was a night map pat to split the workload. No more FNAF. So, Rick and Morty is about to return from its mid-season break, but before it does, I figured it was a good time to take a look at the season's first six episodes to check out where things might be headed next. After ending season five by blowing a huge hole into the universe, Rick and Morty opened to season six with an all-new, all-different mandate. In our previous Rick and Morty theory, we looked specifically at the first episode of the season to conclude that it was all about ways of handling grief. Rick refuses to let go of his past trauma, enough so that he's torturing himself and everyone around around him with it. You always do everything you set your mind to. Except keep your family alive. But that was hardly your fault. Meanwhile, the Jerry from season one's Cronenberg universe completely lets go of his past trauma to a self-destructive degree, refusing to accept anyone into his life and severing all ties with anyone from his past. Your mom and sister died, Morty! And I moved on from caring, and that is the best deal you will ever get. The true solution, however, is found somewhere in the middle. Grief isn't solved by never moving on, but it's also not solved by completely moving on. It's a process of slow healing, acknowledging that that trauma is always going to be a part of you, and just learning to live with that. We concluded that this episode was setting up a season-long theme of healing for Rick, working on himself, and boy, howdy, did we get that one right on the money. I haven't been more right about a theory since, uh... In each of these first six episodes, we watch Rick actively going out of his way to do the most un-Rick thing ever, helping the family members around him. When Beth falls in love with a clone of herself in episode three, we see him doing something we've never seen him do before in the infinite universes, give fatherly advice. I've met myself out there infinite times. Infinite happens, including, as you put it, forgetting the ice cream. You've forgotten the ice cream? Don't worry about what's crazy. As the kids say, you do you. Thank you so much, Dad. When Morty's psyche is fragmented into a billion pieces by a video game, Rick spends a lifetime trying to put those pieces back together, lowering his emotional walls to try and help recover as much of Morty as he can. I thought you would have left by now. I was hoping to get at least half of you home. You really are a good grandson. You know that? I'm proud of you, Morty. Rick even decides to show Jerry some respect. Jerry! I knew I was right. Not even close. I just didn't want to see someone get bullied. You may be the single dumbest human I've ever met, Jerry, but you still have a right to take whatever you want seriously. And when a fortune cookie dooms Jerry to a fate worse than death, Rick even gives up universal power just to save him. You saved me. I will never stop holding this over you. And while he may have lost immortal power, he gained a friend. Thanks, friend. Friend? Did you just say what? friend? What? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry I did that. It's fine. All of this without the crutch of interdimensional portal travel, despite Rick saying that he was working on fixing it throughout the season. I have a process. But of course, nothing can last forever. In the final episode, right before the mid-season break, Rick restores portal travel and promises to return to classic, wacky Rick and Morty adventures. I did it! I fixed portal travel! It's gonna be classic episode, Morty! Adventures, Morty! Social commentary! Rude characters! Here we go! Rick and Morty time! So now, this begs the question. With Rick and the Smiths well on their way through the healing process, what comes next? Are we leaving behind the canon and lore established by the front half of the season and returning to completely disconnected episodic adventures like Rick says? I don't think so. And it's all because of one simple truth. Healing leaves scars. Physically, emotionally, and mentally. And it's time our characters start dealing with those scars. And of them, none is bigger than a certain interdimensional world hopper set up in the season's very first episode. Why are you here? Here. Buddy, I have been asking myself that exact same question. That's right, friends. By analyzing the season's episode so far and what they're saying about the show's characters, I believe that we can predict exactly where Rick and Morty is headed for the rest of the season. And well, yeah, we're gonna see the return of some dimension hopping adventures across space and time. We're also gonna be pulling on a story thread that's been lingering over our heads for several seasons now. Spoiler alert, there's a Rick out there that's gonna shatter the status quo of this universe forever. So open up your emergency fortune cookie loyal theorists. We're Heading in. Now, obviously, Rick healing the bonds with his family was a huge part of these first six episodes, but that wasn't all. Another recurring theme that stood out across the first half of the season was dissatisfaction. Everyone who got what they thought they wanted actually didn't end up all that happy about it. Marta, the leader of the Morty religion inside Morty's brain, manages to unite 92% of the world to her cause. A monumental task, but she's left unhappy with the reality that not everyone in this video game simulation is going to be united as one. The nocturnal Smith Knight family 
finally manages to overthrow the Daysmiths in a coup, thereby allowing them to be in charge of their lives, but then they hate the responsibility that comes with being active during the day, so they voluntarily hand control back to the Daysmiths. When hyper-intelligent space dinosaurs show up on Earth to create a utopia for humanity, humans just become bored with this life without struggle. I can't live like this anymore. At first it was fun spending all day watching whatever YouTube autoplays after the last one autoplayed, but a man can only watch so many ads for Grammarly. Help us go back to the old days where we pretend to fix the problems we cause. In every case, these characters are getting exactly what they wanted, but they're left empty by it in some way or another. So, what does it mean? If you're left unfulfilled after getting what you want, what even is the purpose of life? Is there a purpose to life? Well, that, my friends, brings us to a personal favorite of the Rick and Morty franchise, nihilism. The belief that nothing matters. Now, this is really just boiling it down to the bare bones, but nihilists often believe that there's no moral order, no actual fundamental purpose to life or existence within the universe. Again, nothing matters. And it's this concept that almost perfectly embodies Rick Sanchez, a man who has seen infinity and has thus lost the ability to care about finite things. Nothing matters because all the outcomes are not only possible, they've already happened out there somewhere. He's seen how pointless it is to try and solve a problem. I could take you right now to this same battlefield in a universe where we lost, or another where the war never even happened. All equally real, all equally unreal. None of it matters. Then why did you help? So, you could say that these characters getting what they want and then finding out it didn't mean anything supports the view of nihilism. It proves that Rick Sanchez is right. But there are other ways to look at this philosophy. There's a flip side here that views a pointless universe positively. It's called optimistic nihilism. If we truly live in a universe where nothing matters, well, that's just another way of saying that everything matters equally. Anything can matter as much as you decide it matters. You could, for instance, decide that this channel matters more to you than anything else in the universe and then go and hit that subscribe button below the video. Under optimistic nihilism, that is a perfectly fair assessment. And looking at the general ecosystem of YouTube, yeah, I'd say it's not that far off. In the context of Rick and Morty, of all characters in the show, Morty's the one who most closely represents this belief. He laid this all out way back in season one. Nobody exists on purpose. Nobody belongs anywhere. Everybody's gonna die. Come watch TV. Rick's healing arc through the first half of the season has shown him slowly coming over to this exact idea. He knows that scientifically nothing matters because he's seen the infinite multiverse, but the people and events in his small corner of that multiverse can matter. When Jerry gives Rick a friendship fortune cookie, sure, Rick calls this out as a stupid gesture, but notice that he keeps the fortune. He even goes so far as to look at it again before putting it in his pocket. It's a small gesture that meant something. With Beth constantly going through self-confidence issues, Rick decides to leave out a special wine that helps her open up and discover herself with Space Beth. And when a portion of Morty's psyche asks that Rick keep their video game world on so they can continue to exist, Rick listens and chooses to follow that request. What's with the jacked up Roy machine? Shouldn't you be taking that to repairs? Nah, special order. Some rich <coughs> wants his last game to keep running. Hooked it up to an external battery we're just supposed to store it. He has no reason to do this. He got exactly what he wanted out of the game and has nothing to gain from being beholden to a video game character. And yet, he keeps the game running because it's a nice thing to do. It's a small action that has a big impact in the personal universe of someone else. It's what all of these situations in Season 6 have in common. He has nothing to gain, but he's using his godlike powers to actually help his family. Even back in Episode 1, Rick chooses to rescue the Smiths instead of continuing his self-destructive pursuit of Rick Prime. I could have left you guys. You think the concept of family matters to me? I'm not even your Rick. And this positive attitude is starting to leak into other parts of the show as well. Throughout the last five seasons, Rick has gotten actively annoyed whenever the show gets meta, calling attention to its own narrative in order to play with the concept of how narrative works. That's what the whole Story Train episode was about, a satire on story structure and the in-universe consequences of long-form storytelling. He even has contempt for his own backstory. You wanna jump the shark? You wanna know my stupid crybaby backstory? Knock yourself out. And really, Rick's previous hatred for the idea of continuity is just an extension of his nihilism. If you believe that nothing matters, well, canon and lore directly conflict with that belief. But now, after healing and embracing this more optimistic view of the world, Rick suddenly cares about the potential stories that his series can explore. For example, when he's asked about the rift left by last season's finale, he actively defends its existence. If you'd like, we could patch up your little interdimensional rift to- No, leave it. I know how to close that. It's there for a reason, very canonical. Normally, that's the sort of thing that would drive him insane. He'd despise the fact that it's there. And yet, when the space dinosaurs sew the rift shut, Rick becomes furious about the apparent loss of potential stories. It, it was all canonical and we could have milked that thing for a whole season. Or, or, or like a three episode arc at least. 
beast! Continuity is slowly starting to matter to him because it anchors him. It grounds him. It gives him something to actually care about. Sure, in the grand scheme it might be meaningless, but to him, it does have meaning. But this sort of investment from characters as powerful as Rick can have some major consequences. In episode 6, we meet the space dinosaurs, super intelligent beings on par with Rick. These dinosaurs travel the universe to help other species while doing sick ollies. It's on, Iguanodon! But wherever the dinosaurs go to help, meteors follow. Apparently, a species of giant meteor evolved to be their equal opposite, their ideological nemesis. As these reptiles evolved to higher and higher levels of loving vegan godhood, another life form devolved into an equally selfless, hate-filled species of barely sentient rocks. They hurtle through space and do as much damage as they can to their chosen enemy, which is guess who? It's a force of absolute death and destruction versus an equal and opposite force of creation and creativity. The more good the dinosaurs do, the more successful they are, the more meteors are born to destroy their progress. And here's the thing. If this is indeed a rule of the universe, enough so that it's happened several times to the dinosaurs, this then also applies to Rick. After all, he and the space dinos already see themselves as equals. From one god being to another, you're welcome. So it would follow that Rick also has himself an equal and opposite force. A force that's been evolving alongside Rick in the opposite direction. Oh, ho, ho, you found me! I shoot the first monitor too. That's right, loyal theorists. I believe that Rick Prime, the character that killed our Rick's family and started the entire chain of events that would lead to this series, is not only our Rick's nemesis, but his universal counterweight. Kind of. It's actually more accurate to say that our Rick is Rick Prime's meteor. See, from what we can tell, Rick Prime is basically the Rickest Rick in all existence, and seems to be the embodiment of that pessimistic view of nihilism that our Rick used to follow. Out of what little we've seen of him, Rick Prime genuinely doesn't seem to care about anything beyond spreading the good word of not caring about anything to his fellow Ricks. Ricks don't pass on this. He doesn't even seem to care about his family at all. Morty, for you to be bait, the guy'd have to value something. He truly does not give a sh Basically, Rick Prime is like the Rick that we knew from previous seasons, but amped up to 11, without any of the character development, growth, and healing that we've seen our Rick going through. He's the sort of guy that would hop to a new universe in a heartbeat, leaving all his loved ones behind the second things get dicey. So, just like the space dinosaurs floated through the universe helping out anyone they could, Rick Prime goes from universe to universe making things worse through the creation of other pessimistic, nihilistic Ricks. But in that process, he literally created our Rick. Rick. He killed his wife and daughter, which sets off the events of the series, including the healing and character growth that we're watching our Rick go through right now. And through this process, our Rick has taken his first steps to being Rick Prime's equal opposite, a Rick that genuinely cares. You know the status quo of this franchise? The irreverent adventures where nothing of any consequence happens? That is a thing of the past, represented in a lot of ways by Rick Prime. Just think, we finally know what happened to our Rick's family, when it happened on the timeline, where it happened in the multiverse, how it went down and who did it. But we're still missing that one key piece of data. Why? Why did Rick Prime do this in the first place? Explicitly, all we get is a vague, off-handed explanation that Ricks don't typically refuse the call to multiversal adventure. But we don't know why it's so important to Rick Prime that other Ricks follow in his footsteps. Maybe this is why. Maybe he understands that an equally powerful but oppositely aligned Rick would one day rise up to stop him. And he wanted to make sure that that didn't happen. Or maybe fate is just pulling him to create his equal opposite Rick. I, for one, can't wait to find out. But hey, we interrupt your regularly scheduled programming to bring you your daily allotment of capitalism. That's right, loyal theorists. The holiday season is quickly approaching, and you know that means we got ourselves some new theory wear that makes the perfect gift for you or the theorist in your life. This time around, if you don't feel like wearing any game theory green, we've got ourselves some film theory merch to help you rep the red. First off, we got this great Film Theory Academy hoodie for anyone who wants to embrace their inner film student. It's a really cool design and we kept it a little bit oversized so you can be cozy inside of those chilly movie theaters as you get ready to watch insert Disney tentpole here this holiday. Plus, we also have ourselves an awesome Screen Fiend Vintage Ringer t-shirt, which would look amazing layered under that Academy hoodie. It's almost like we planned the stuff out. Oh, and uh, this one's a bit wild, but do you love vintage analog horror, but you just wish you could give the tapes a big old fuzzy hug? Well, now you can with our Film Theory VHS plushie. It even comes with a cool little zippered 
case to keep it safe. Just one warning, don't feed it after midnight. And if you've ever wondered what this channel smells like, you can find out with our new candle set. At the very least, you can help them summon the next season of Rick and Morty that much faster. So grab a gift that'll make the theorist in your life happy or just treat yourself to a little something special this holiday. You deserve a nice gift too. Links to all the items are below this video or you can just go to theorywear.com to check out the full collection. I think there are some special discounts and bundles over on the merch site, so you might want to check those out. And in the meantime, remember, it's all just a theory. A film theory. And cut.